If you want, if you still haven't visited a 400 level class, the coolest class of the year, actually there are two of them, is when we've got, it's, it's heat transfer, 423, and they, uh, all the students do their own projects. Uh, and, and, they, and they go and analyze them and then they report on them. That is going to be uh, the last Monday and Tuesday of class, and, and uh, there are some projects this time like, could you design blinds, window blinds, that actually help heat the house? Or uh, uh, instead of piling up snow, like they do in the uh, Walmart parking lot and get great big piles of snow, <clears throat> could you design a snow digester that would uh, melt the, you'd, you'd load the snow in as you shoveled it, and it'd melt it all, and you'd, it'd go into, as water into storage tanks, and you could just go dump the water in, in the river or something like that. So, uh, uh, some interesting projects this year. That's going to be uh, April 8th, Monday the 8th, and then the 9th during our lab time. If you want to come to those, you are, uh, everyone is welcome to come to those. So those are, those, that's, that's some of the best class of the year. Because you don't have to listen to me talk. Uh, that's a good for a good. Okay. So, what's that? What kinds of those classes? Oh, oh, that's the bad, that's the bad part. It's a 7.45 in the morning class. Oh, oh well. Uh, but the lab, that's on Monday. The lab on Tuesday is a 10.15 lab. It's in room 157. And uh, it goes, it'll, it'll, it, the lab period is two hours long. We'll probably spend the whole two hours doing uh, presentations. And uh, you're welcome to, to drift in and out any time during there, in there, and, and get your one hour in, however you want to. OK. Uh, Random musings of a former con government contract engineer. I'll tell you a little bit about government contract engineering. It's, a, uh, it's an exciting world because you never know when you're going to get fired. So, uh, my, my background, I did my master's work in coal. Master's thesis, coal collection and characterization of pyrolyzed coal char and tar at high pressure. And that was such a boring uh, title, I thought I want to do something else for a living. So I went on to get my PhD at Penn State where they had a NASA um, funded uh, propulsion research center, and so I used uh, s some NASA computer codes for my PhD work. Spent a, a summer down at NASA Marshall, down in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, May 2001, I began work as a co government contractor at, with Lockheed Martin at, at NASA Stennis. Uh, and before any of you say, "Oh, I want to work at Lockheed Martin," maybe I'll go talk to Brother Danes. Uh, the the government contractors at Lockheed Martin were the ugly stepchildren. We didn't, Lockheed Martin didn't claim us, NASA didn't claim us. It's the wonders of being a government contractor. <laughs> anyway, October 2003, I began working at Navy's High Performance Computing Center. Uh, January 2004, I used a get out of jail free card that I was given when I, when I said, yeah, I'll, I'll try the Navy thing for a while. And I went back to the NASA side. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about all those things. Um, August 2004, I continued working as a government contractor, but now I work for Jacob Swerga. And so it was m almost all the same people, with the exception of like two or three bosses a couple of levels up. And it was all exactly the same work, because we were doing that government contract work for NASA. But there was a different name on the paycheck, and uh, I got different benefits. I had to change my health insurance, and, I, and my, my uh, vacation time changed. And Steve being three weeks, I got two weeks. So, you know, lots of fun things. And then uh, about seven years ago, seven and a half years ago, I started here at BYU Idaho. Well, so fall. Fall 2000, I found myself needing to look for jobs, so I checked all the usual suspects, and uh, and uh, one of my favorite was uh, going to the uh, online sites. I went to Lockheed Martin; they had a, a few jobs available, and there was one I applied to. And uh, I, about a week later, I got a, a rejection postcard from them saying, "I'm sorry, we really don't want you here." And then a week later, I got a second one from the same place, and, and another week later, I got a third one from exactly the same place. So I got the idea; they really didn't want to hire me. Um, so, you know, job, job, job searches are, are exciting times. It turns out what, ha what worked for me is when I graduated school connections. So, I had a friend from graduate school, uh, and I went to a conference, and he said, I hear you're looking for a job. I said, yeah, I am. He said, oh. Uh, this was, this was uh, Harry. Harry says, oh, Shameen down at, at NASA is looking for someone just like you. Give Shameen a call, and he'll give you the job. And I said, okay, I'll do that. So, I got home, and I said, Harry told me, tell me you're like, oh, yeah, we're, yeah, Harry told me. Uh, come on down, we'll, we'll interview you and we'll, we'll get you a job. And, and it, it worked because uh, uh, in, 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 if, you ever go, if you're going into the uh, research end of, uh, if any of you want to get your PhD and you want to do research, 
my PhD advisor said, you only get money from your friends, which is true. You, you got to know the people who are giving the money pretty much to get the money. And it works the same way for jobs. You tend, you tend to get jobs from your friends, too. Uh, and graduate school is a great place to, to build connections. So um, they, they, they happen to use exactly the same uh, CFD code that I used for my PhD work. Uh, it was a NASA code. That, that helped. Uh, again, friends, and, and I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, the guy who had left before, and they hadn't been able to find uh, some, any to fill it. Plug for graduate school. Uh, graduate school is a great place to develop additional skills to make you even more marketable. Um, it's a place to develop relationships, uh, other, other graduate students and, and faculty, um, and, and they are going to be your network in the future. So the, the uh, more diverse of a graduate school you go to, typically the more diverse job opportunities you're going to have. And uh, uh, in graduate school, one thing that most students don't understand I hear students say, well, I, I, I want to go work for a company who will pay my way through graduate school. And I say, well, that's kind of a, a, a straw man because graduate school will pay you way for, through graduate school. Right now, I, we've got students out there who are making fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 a year. They're being paid on top of all their tuition to, to go do research work for, for people at, uh, at big prestigious universities. And that's, that's the other thing. The more prestigious the university, not the harder it is to get into, but the easier it is to get in and get money because they're prestigious because they get lots and lots of money. And they get lots and lots of money because they have lots of graduate students and they give all that money away to graduate students. It's, it's, a, it's a great Ponzi scheme. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, what's that? I, I would. You, you, get a better, you get better connections and uh, you're more likely to get paid. Which is counterintuitive, but it's true. So, uh, some things to think about. Okay, so the job. Senior Engineer, Test Technology Group, Lockheed Martin Space Operations. My specialty was computational fluid dynamic, dynamics, and they wanted me to do the analyses for uh, uh, using neat fluid uh, dynamics tools I had. Uh, support test operations, troubleshooting, whenever people had problems. They, they had a set of regular engineers who did all the regular stuff. When they had problems, I was, test technology was where they go when they have problems that, that, that regular engineers can't solve, which makes it kind of a fun job. Uh, and maintain their computational cluster. NASA Stennis is on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. In fact, uh, many of you know the geography of, of Katrina. The eye of Katrina in 2005 went right over Stennis. So, by the way, I moved here three weeks before Katrina. <laughs> it was, uh, and my kids said, oh, our timing is horrible. I, no, this is, that's, never mind. That, it's completely unknown. We won't go there. But, uh, but it, was, it, was, it was kind of, ask me sometime. I'll tell you about our house down there. Uh, I, I lived on the Louisiana side. This is, this is right on the Mississippi side of the Mississippi-Louisiana border. Uh, it's the NASA Center for Rocket Engine Testing. And it's, it was started in the, the Apollo era where they started testing the F-1 engines for the uh, Apollo spacecraft. And uh, those were 1.5 million pound thrust engines. They, they really shook the ground nicely. And when they put all five of them together, tested all five of them together, which is the configuration for the Apollo, they were breaking windows 10 miles away when the wind was wrong. So they learned a lot about acoustics during that time. <laughs> um, OK, so, let's, so what, what do they do at Stennis? This is, this is the test stance of Stennis. This is the E-complex right here. Uh, there's uh, A1 right there, A2 right there, and B1 and 2 right there out in the distance. We would test full-size engines sometimes, and that's what, that's what the A stands and the B stands were for, was testing full-blown engines. But a lot of the times, most of our testing was done here in the E complex, where we t tested bits and pieces of the engines. Because you have to test them a, a piece of time, make sure your piece is working before you put them all together and, and, make, and do your whole system test. So this, for example, is a space shuttle main engine. We did some work on that. You've got the nozzle down here. You've got all sorts of plumbing up here. This is a turbo pump that you can see right here. And a lot of the stuff is buried. There's another turbo pump right here. This is kind of a schematic. So we've got low pressure fuel turbo pump, uh, a fuel pre-burner right here. You burn a little bit of fuel to, to drive the turbo pump. Here's our uh, high pressure fuel turbo pump. Here's the oxidizer pre-burner and the oxidizer turbo pump. And, uh, and then that sends high pressure. So this stuff is coming in at about atmospheric pressure, a little bit above. And uh, it's coming 
into the engine combustion chamber at about 3,000 psi, 3,000 pounds per square inch. Uh, so this is your your fuel coming in here, oxidizer coming in here. Here are your injectors right here, combustion chamber right there, and nozzle right there. So we tested all these things. We tested fuel preburners, oxygen preburners, uh, fuel turbo pumps, oxygen turbo pumps, injectors, combustion chambers, nozzles, and all that we do at this e-complex. And most of my the work I'm doing, uh, I'm going to tell you about, is related to that kind of stuff. And and so. You see down here in various places, there's, a, there's a, a fuel tank right there, a big spherical one. Here's some cylindrical ones. And uh, because when we're testing bits and pieces, you have to, all this other stuff that supports everything that is up to that piece, you have to, to create test uh, facility stuff, piping and, and pumps and, uh, and pressurized tanks to, to give you the input that you'd have in a full-size engine. So that's, that's what we have in these test stands is all sorts of piping and fuel tanks and valves and things to, to, so that we can test these things in, in exactly the conditions they're going to be run at under. Okay, so let's move on here. Is this rocket science? <laughs> it's, it's rocket science, but it's easy rocket science. Yeah. Okay, so my first task was uh, they were doing a liquid oxygen preburner, which, again, uh, powers the high-pressure LOX, LOX turbo pump. And uh, so the pre-burner takes in mostly oxygen, puts a little bit of hydrogen in it. We're dealing mostly with hydrogen-oxygen rockets. And, and you burn that little bit of hydrogen. So what's coming out is mostly oxygen that you're going to be pumping into the engine. But it's now at, at high pressure, so you can drive the pump. Well, so when we're testing just that one component, we're dumping all this pretty much pure liquid oxygen, or, well, by that time, it's gaseous oxygen, out into the atmosphere. And there's a problem. To oxygen, everything looks like fuel. You dump hot oxygen out, and metal looks like fuel, and test stands look like fuel, and so <laughs> they want to keep the, the uh, exhaust away from the test facilities. So that was our first task, because they were going to be dumping uh, lots and lots of this. Oh, by the way, the space shuttle main engine, the, the uh, LOX turbo pump for the space shuttle main engine, this wasn't space shuttle, but just to give you an idea of, of, kind of some of the, the volumes we're working with, it pumps out 2,000 pounds per second of liquid oxygen. If you were to use a, a space shuttle turbo pump to fill or drain a swimming pool, you could drain an Olympic sized swimming pool in about 10 seconds. <laughs> so that's the kind of volumes we're, we're talking about. It. Now this was a little bit smaller, but, but still we're, we're looking at uh, uh, some fairly large flow rates. Uh, okay, so here we go. Here's our, this is the uh, Oh, this, is, this, is, this is the beauty of, of using um, acronyms, by the way, when you do your writing, is 10 years later you'll never remember what those acronyms mean anymore. This is in, integrated power, D stands for something else. So when you, when you write, don't use acronyms, especially in my classes. Anyway, uh, so this is, this is the LOX pre-burner. It's going to be dumping pretty much pure oxygen out, and they want to keep it away from the, from the test stand. So they said, design us a duct so that it's big enough so that it'll all that all that exhaust will get t taken as far away from the test stand as we can, but don't design it too big because we have to make this out of really uh, some some pretty fancy uh, metal alloys and it's going to be really expensive. And so we uh, we did the CFD the computational fluid dynamics to say it looks like we need if I remember right it's about a 22 inch duct is what we ended up with and uh, and we predicted what would happen, and then, so here's our experimental. This is a, a thermal imaging uh, uh, video, and it showed hot spots and cold spots. You see a hot spot there, a cold spot there, a hot, uh, another warm spot right there. And our see so the data, the temperature data is these dotted lines right here, and, uh, and the, the, the solid lines are, are predicted. So we, we did a pretty good job predicting what the temperature would be. So we, we have some pretty good confidence that we were doing it right. Um, and so here is the, the animations. The top one is oxygen mass fraction. When it gets red, that's a lot of oxygen. That's what we want to keep away from the, uh, from the test stand. The test stand is back in this area. So we want to keep red from getting back in here. We want all the red to stay down in here. And here's the temperature. 
And this white wall right there is our diffuser that we designed and put in. And so here we go. See a little bit leaking out right there, but then it's sucked back in. And so we said, it looks like it's going to do what we want it to do. They were also wondering what's going to happen when we shut down or, or, the, or the pressure waves that come back down going to uh, be put too much force on, on our, on our uh, test article. And so we did the pressure wave right there. And uh, you can see the shock wave coming back down the tube. I'll run these one more time. Um, so here's oxygen mass fraction. Dang. No. Oh, well. I won't run another time. Um, yes, you question? that oxygen is coming out of gas? It's gaseous by the time you get done uh, yeah. going through the pre burn. So this is hot oxygen going out? Hot oxygen that we're, we're dumping out. Yep. <laughs> Well, that was the oxygen fuel uh, pre-burner. Uh, hydrogen fuel pump, turbine drive. Uh, this, is, this is the hydrogen pre-burner. Was, was kind of the, the one that's on the other side. One was on the oxygen side, one was on the fuel side. Uh, chemically reacting, compressible flow. So they, they did a trickle test. And the wind was blowing. And a, a blue plastic tarp that was covering some stuff on the test stand melted. And so they got a little panicky. It was during a trickle test. So they were, they were only flowing about one and a half pounds per second of, uh, of hydrogen. Uh, but, but what happens is hydrogen, now oxygen, you want to keep it away from things because it can start things on fire. Hydrogen, on the other hand, uh, you want to burn that as it comes out because if you get a big buildup of, of hydrogen and there's a spark or something that, that ignites it, it makes a lot of noise and it scares the test operators and they don't like that. So we, we try to keep that uh, from happening to um, and, and so we're burning this hydrogen as it comes out. So now we've got this, this flame, this hydrogen plume coming out, and, uh, and at very low flow rates it was melting the, the tarp, and they said, oh dear, how about when we run at 160 pounds per second? Is that going to do something, because it's only one and a half pounds per second, could that endanger the test stand? So we did the, we did the full scale, we, we modeled the full scale one and we said, um, so this is uh, this is with a with a headwind of 20 miles an hour that we tend to blow up back into the test stand, uh, and and uh, this is what we predicted. And we thought, oh, that nose right there, that looks like a, a computational artifact. I don't think that's really true. And then we actually got pictures of it, and there's a nose right there. So we said, well, maybe that kind of is real. And so we learned something from that. Uh, and what we found out is that they had they had melt the tarp at, at, at the worst possible uh, scenario. The, the slower you flow it at, the less momentum it has coming out, and the, the more it tends to get blown back into the test stand. So we were able to tell them that, and they were, they were happy, and, and uh, the test went off, and, and nothing, went, nothing went bad. Well, then uh, they, they had a problem with pressure regulators. So, uh, they couldn't, they couldn't keep this uh, pressure regulator working. They were trying to get about 800 PSI downstream here from 4,400 PSI source. What a pressure regulator does, if you, any, any of you seen gas bottles like for welding and things, those all, all have pressure regulators on them. And it takes a very high pressure uh, gas, in, in case of welding, it's in the gas bottles. And it cuts down to, to something that is, is usable so that you don't blow things apart, because high pressure gases can do a pretty job blowing things apart. Well, this, uh, this pressure regulator, the, the way it works is you've got this pocket valve, and uh, it's spring-loaded, and, and, and by, by adjusting what you want the pressure, it'll, it'll move that pocket valve down a, a, a short distance. <coughs> well, they're having problems because this thing was, the for, there were forces on this thing that were making it bounce up and down at about 6,000 times per second, 6, six kilohertz. Uh, frequency, and uh, and when it's bouncing up and down that fast, the seat right here would just get ground to powder in, in a matter of seconds. They said, "Can you figure out what's going on here?" So uh, we modeled it up. Uh, this, so here's here's our our valve. There's the inlet. There's the poppet. The f the air flows in between those little gaps up through the body and out the outlet. And what we noticed was that there was unsteadiness right here. Uh, the, uh, 
the streamlines would go down and they'd come down and back up. So, so there's streamlines here to show what direction the flow is going. And there's also, uh, the, this shows the pressure. The contours show the pressure on the, at the different levels. This one's the important one. This is on the face of the poppet. Because we know that there are forces acting on that poppet. And pressure times an area gives a force. So we want to see what, those, what the pressure forces were. Uh, and uh, okay, so so high pressure. There, there's a phase where there's high pressure. You can see there's there's high pressure back here, low pressure up here. This is this is kind of the, the trailing edge. This is the leading edge. Leading edge doesn't change a whole lot. It's pretty similar, but it's this back edge where the where you saw the recirculation in the picture before. That's where our pressure is is fluctuating a lot. Um, and we found that our models showed a, 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 a fluctuation. It was fluctuating at a rate of about 4.8 kilohertz. The uh, actual uh, fluctuation was 6 kilohertz, which maybe doesn't sound terribly close, but, but it was, that's really pretty good. So we, uh, we figured we understood the processes, uh, what was going on, so we were able to tell them uh, what, how, to, how to fix it. So we've done a, a pressure regulator valve. They said, oh, you guys know how to do valves. We've got another valve that we've got a problem with. We've got this 10-inch, uh, it's called a Y valve because it's kind of in a Y shape. Here's the, here's the poppet right here. Here's the inflow. There's the outflow. And, and you can see it kind of makes a wide pattern right there. This is, this is a control valve for controlling the, uh, the fuel and oxygen that goes in. They wanted to use it with locks, but it wasn't rated for locks. And like I said, oxygen, they, they get really fussy with oxygen in there. They will not flow gaseous oxygen unless absolutely necessary. And, uh, and the locks is, is almost as bad, just because all you need is, is one hot spot or one spark, and you can, you can burn up an entire test facility. Um, so uh, this wasn't, this valve was not rated for locks, for oxygen. And they wanted to know, do the cavitation rings in this valve cause a problem because you don't want edges and corners when you're flowing oxygen. That's where things can, can heat up. Is, is there a risk? Would the valve perform, and also, uh, would the valve perform acceptably if we ground out those, those uh, cavitation rings? So we looked at it, looked at the flow in the cavitation rings, and we said, it, it looks like it'll be all right. And then we ground, we, we modeled it with the cavitation rings ground out. And uh, we said, and it looks like it should perform about the same, does, same way as it does with those cavitation rings ground out. Um, this is, oh, by the way, this is the plug. This is that moves in and out. That as you move this plug out, it allows the flow coming through there to increase because it increases this gap size as we pull the, pull the plug out. Uh, so, but, but we said, how do we know the results are right? They're, they're, we needed a way to quantify errors. And so we looked into something called uh, verification validation, which is uh, a method of determining how far from exact a numerical answer is because a numerical answer is really kind of different than an experimental answer. With a numerical answer, we can run this a hundred times and we get exactly the same answer to seven digits every single time because we're doing it on a computer. And if you do it experimentally, that's not the case. So you can experimentally, you just say, well, let's run a bunch of uh, tests and get some some uh, standard deviation, do some statistical analysis. You can't do it on on numerical method work. So we had to learn. We learned about verification and validation. So I went. Uh, I took a short course on it, and I learned about it, and I, I wrote up a report, and, and they were all happy about that, and uh, added value to both me and my company. And this one person, uh, one professional I've talked to said, your value to the company is the growth of your abilities. So uh, when you're out there working, the, the more you can add to your abilities, the more valuable you'll be to, uh, to uh, your company. So here's my the validation and verification. Uh, it says that we can put error bars on, and and as we add more and more grid points, our error bars should get smaller. So here our error bars getting smaller. But the other thing that it allowed us to do is we said, you know, this allows us to extrapolate and predict where things are going. It gives us some really interesting numerical tools because these tests right here took about 30 minutes to run. These runs on the computer at 250,000 grid points would take eight hours. Uh, when we ran out to about a million grid points, that'd take about a week. 
And you'd say, well, we need to as accurate as possible, so we should run this one. But we found out if you do these in a much shorter time, you can use the verification validation techniques to extrapolate uh, <coughs> extrapolate the, your results, and you know what this is going to be. And, and so uh, that's, that's what this is showing, uh, which, was, which was really nice because we were able to say, hey, we've got a shorter turnaround time, and we get just these, the same accuracy of the, the answers. And, uh, so here's our, here's our valves in red and green, two different CFD codes. The blue is the experimental test data. Unfortunately, we didn't do it right on it, but you can see that <coughs> it looks like it's lining up pretty nicely. So we, uh, we had a pretty good comparison with the experiment there. So we were becoming experts on valves, and, and, we, and they said, great, we've got another valve for you to assess the split body valve. And we, we ran it, and boy, we really missed on that one. Uh, our analysis flopped, so what happened? We did a, th everything we'd been doing to this point was two-dimensional. We said, oh, we'll just assume it axisymmetric. And it had been working just fine. On this one, we went to a full 3D uh, model. And, and we're starting to see some of those recirculation zones in the valve body, kind of like we saw with the pressure regulator valve. And, and the flow was not flowing equally around both sides of the plug. See, here's the plug right there. And we aren't getting the flow there and there to be the same. In fact, we're getting a whole lot more flow down here than we are up here. So, 3D effects really dominate this valve. So we said, okay, to do this one, we've got to do full 3D, which is going to be a lot more expensive if you still want to do it. And then NASA has decided they want us to do it or not. Um, and so they said, we've got another problem. We were trying to shut off the hydrogen flow, and it wouldn't shut off. We had a 12,000 pound hydraulic ram pushing this valve, this, this valve closed, trying to push the plug closed. And 12,000 pounds of force were not enough to push it closed. Uh, and, and they said, 12,000 pounds should be a lot. And, and so we looked at it, and uh, we did our, our valve analysis, and we found out that uh, the pressure forces acting on the face of that plug weren't, weren't sufficient to make it stall. And so we said, hmm, what's going on here? Uh, we worked with the company to get us some, a little bit better CFD tools. Um, oh, by the way, I, I knew two of the people who developed the code from graduate school, so uh, it, it, it worked out very nicely. Um, I, I actually was aware of them because I knew known about them from graduate school. Uh, we were getting choked flow, and when the flow chokes, you can start to get unsteady effects. And that's exactly what was happening. And the unsteady effects in this case were, were important. The average force from, from steady flow was not enough, but the unsteady force up in this yellow zone was enough to stall the valve out. So we were able to help them figure out what was going on there. And so here are the unsteady pressure fluctuations coming downstream from the valve. And uh, you can see it's... it's How did they overcome it? Did you go to like a larger valve or something? They, 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 they modified the downstream conditions to keep it from going unsteady. And, and that's what you can do sometimes with these valves is, is uh, the timing of the valves there's some downstream valves, there's some upstream valves, and you can change the timing a little bit. Once you know what's going on, you know where to, where to go and look to, to fix things like that. Okay, another new area, propellant tanks. Um, in, in a full-size engine, you've got the, the uh, turbo pumps that provide the pressurized flow. Well, in a test facility, you have propellant tanks, and you pressurize those. Uh, one we worked with was a 13-foot diameter uh, LOX tank that could be pressurized to 15,000 PSI. Uh, it has, the, the, the walls are one foot thick stainless steel, and it's really hard to see through a foot of stainless steel, so you can't see inside. They were talking about, is there, would, would it be a way to get sensors inside there to, to see where the level of, of LOX in is, is in this tank? And, and uh, so they, they thought about that, but in the meantime, they said, you go, you go model it and tell us what's going on. One, one of the engineers said, uh, I need to show you a picture of this. Anyway, the LOX is pressurized with nitrogen. How long until nitrogen starts getting into, our, into the pipes that go to our test article? Because at that point, uh, the data becomes meaningless because we don't know how much oxygen and how much nitrogen is going in. Um, so this is what, this is what a, uh, these propellant tanks look like. They're big and circular. This up here is a diffuser. And this diffuser looks like, uh, take, take a, a can and poke a whole bunch of holes in it. And uh, then flow gas in through that, well, hot nitrogen in this case. And it goes out through those holes and it pressurizes everything. 
without being too disruptive. But uh, one engineer said, you know, I think it's going to be like a dishwasher in there or a washing machine in there where this stuff is just going to be churning like crazy. And we said, we don't think so. And so the bet was on. And so here was our first try. And here's the nitrogen in blue. And it goes down the side and it goes straight down and right out the tube and traps all this liquid oxygen up there. And we said, that doesn't look right. Does that look right to you? What would you expect? So, so this liquid oxygen is at 90 K, 90 Kelvin. The, the, the nitrogen coming in is gaseous, but it's hot. It's 300 K, which is hot, right? Well, when you're at 90 K, 300 K is hot. Uh, 300 K is room temperature. Um, and, and we said, there should be buoyancy effects keeping this stuff up. And we said, oh, buoyancy. We don't have buoyancy in our CFD code. So we, we went back and we, uh, uh, we, put, we said, we need to put buoyancy in there. So, because buoyancy is a, is a really not a very strong force. So most of the flows we were dealing with, when we were dealing with the flows that are traveling at Mach 2 and Mach 3, or, or even at, at, at several tens of, of meters per second, buoyancy just is not a very big force, but the flow rates, the, the velocities here were slow enough. They're down below, down around 2, 3 meters per second. Buoyancy was important. So we had to modify the code, had to do some programming. And here was our... Here it was with buoyancy, and we see it starting to come down like before, but now the buoyant force pulls that less, less dense fluid back up, and we're getting mostly liquid nitrogen, or liquid oxygen down here. Um, I'm doing zebra striping here. I, I did zebra striping to show them what was going on. Every 1% difference in oxygen concentration is shown by a stripe. So this would be like 96%, the white's 95, this red's 94, this white's 93 just so you can see very clearly when, when things are, uh, are changing. And uh, one thing that, that we knew from the very beginning is engineers don't like contour plots. Uh, CFD engineers love contour plots because we, we deal with those all the time and so it, we can see what's going on. Most engineers don't like contour plots, they like line plots. So we made a line plot of, them, of it, which is what they cared about, which is, well, how much nitrogen is there at the tank exit? And so there's our plot of nitrogen at tank exit, and they were happy. They said, okay, it looks like we've got, until we get 1% nitrogen, which is our cutoff, we've got almost about five and a quarter seconds of runtime. And so they knew how long they could run it uh, before they had to cut off the test. And uh, so uh, Kennedy Space Center said, heard that we knew how to do propellant tanks, and they had redesigned the space shuttle propellant tank, and, and they, uh, and all of a sudden, it was taking twice as much helium to pressurize their tanks as it was before. And they said, what's happening? What, what, what's going on here? We did a re redesign, and all of a sudden, everything's not working. So we did a quick analysis for them and said, oh, yeah, your redesign has increased your heat transfer a lot, and so it's going to take a lot more. So they were happy to hear that. They weren't happy to hear that, but it was nice. To know. <laughs> uh, now, this is, this is a choice that almost all of you are going to have to make at some time in your career, and that is... Do you want to stay technical, or do you want to go into management? And I had that choice, uh, the chance to work on a Navy contract to lead the visualization group. The visualiza so Navy Oceanographic Center does, uh, uh, they do a lot of, of uh, visualization. They, they, they keep track of the ocean for the Navy, because warships need to know what's going on. So they've got data buoys across the entire uh, globe and and they bring that data in and they, and uh, they reduce that data and, and this is one of the many things they do and uh, and uh, so I was I was going to lead up the visualization group because I had CFD background and they were all programmers and so this is this is the uh, this is just the data reduction this takes all the data from their data buoys from all over the world and they they every, once once a, a day. They take all that and they reduce it down and get these maps. This is the temperature, ocean, o ocean surface temperature, and this is the ocean surface temperature anomaly, which means how far is above average for this time of year. Red means above average, blue means below average, and so they can keep track of things. And so I worked on this uh, to, to, to get this up and running for them. They had it on a, on a proprietary system, and I was getting some open source tools to, to get that to work. But I, was, I found myself managing people that I didn't know what they were doing because I wasn't 
uh, familiar enough with, uh, I didn't have the background in, in uh, OpenGL programming, it was basically what they were doing. And I didn't even know C++ actually. But, uh, uh, and and uh, it made me very uncomfortable. Not only that, but I knew that, uh, that uh, from some management experiences I'd had on the NASA side when I was an assistant, our, our, our team lead took off for Iraq for, a, for six months or a year and I had to fill in this place. And there was a, a, an engineer who, in the mid-90s, he was the star. He, they were, he was doing some things that were absolutely phenomenal. He was predicting when uh, rocket engines would fail um, typically two test cycles before they actually fail. He, he'd say, it looks like something's failing, and he got it narrowed down. He could tell him exactly what component. This looks like the bearings in this, in this part of, of the rocket engine right here. And, uh, and they were able to, to not have catastrophic failures in their, in their rocket engine testing anymore when they, when they did that. But 10 years later, NASA said, oh, we're not interested in that anymore. He's, he was a PhD. That was a specialty. And so I, as the team lead, acting team lead, I had to find money for him. And if, if worse came to worse, I would have had to have fired him. And I thought, you know, that's not for me. I'm not that kind of person. I don't want management. So I uh, returned to NASA, contract, and stayed technical. I said, uh, three months of, of management is enough for me. I think I'll, I'll stay away from the assignment. <coughs> and so uh, one of my later assignments is SSME flow liner duct. Uh, this was, they were going to test a piece of the space shuttle main engine that was cracking. And this was after the Columbia disaster. And they were trying to track down everything that they knew uh, had gone wrong in the past. And they wanted to see, what can we do about that? Is there a fix that we can put in? Is this going to be important? And the, uh, the flow line of cracks was one of those things. Well, uh, we were going to test, we were going to do the, the actual testing at Stennis. And Marshall was going to model the pump. The pump is right down here at the duct exit. This is the duct that, that models the, the duct work in the main engine so that they get all the acoustics right and everything. They thought it was an acoustic problem. And, uh, and Marshall was modeling the pump and they said, well, we'll just assume a uniform inlet flow to the pump. Turbo pumps are very sensitive to the inlet flow. And we said, well, we're testing this here. Let us do the duct work. And they said, okay, go ahead and do it. And we, we were able to, this is, you can see the cross sections. Uh, we, we looked at the flow right here coming in, this is uniform, uh, this is, uh, yeah, the, the uniform flow at the inlet for a pipe flow. And as we move downstream, it's very much not uniform. By the time we get to the duct exit, it's not horrible, but it's certainly far from uniform. And when, when Marshall found out, they, they actually put our uh, inlets in, it changed the performance of their pump fairly significantly. So, uh, uh, so I got a, a silver Snoopy from that, which is the only award from from NASA that meant anything. They gave, they gave lots and lots of awards because what you'll find when you get to a company is it's a lot easier and cheaper to give you a piece of paper saying, we're giving you a lightning award or we're giving you a frontline award. I've, I've got all the, those stacked up and I can show them to you. And they're, they're pretty worthless because it's cheaper to do that than give you a raise. Uh, so, uh, but but this, is, this one is actually given out by the, you have to be nominated for it and it's given out by the astronauts. And so I had an astronaut who had actually flown on a space shuttle came and gave me a, a plaque and so that was that was pretty cool but uh, the reason I got this I don't have a lot of time to talk about this but but communication is really really important when I was in graduate school uh, I was given a piece of advice they said write monthly uh, progress reports for your your uh, boss even if he doesn't require you to because uh, your job one way to look at this is your job as an engineer is to make your boss look good so he can get promoted and the way you make your boss look good is by giving him stuff so he knows exactly what's going on. He can pass that up the line to uh, bosses above him that are more clueless than him. Uh, and so if you can write it in a way that people who have never seen, been, stepped inside an engineering class can understand exactly what you're doing, uh, they'll say, he's a really good engineer. And, and that's what happened to me. So I, I <laughs> was writing these progress reports and other people weren't. And so, so I was getting, oh, he, he gets outstanding on his, on his performance evaluation. Uh, when I really wasn't doing much more than anyone else, I was just doing a better job communicating it. So communication is really important. Uh, learn how to, to, to keep your, your boss informed. Um, so lessons learned. Take opportunities to grow. Learn new tools. 
um, that those those help get you uh, skills that will keep you uh, employable. Get to know others because uh, they can help you. Learn to communicate. You're going to have to make a choice, technical or management, and, and learn from what you're doing. So that's that's kind of. Uh, in, in four years of work there, I learned six things. So that, that's not too bad. That's one and a half things to learn per year, right? Anyway. So that is, uh, that was NASA STEMIS. Any questions? No questions. Then go away. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a chance to think here for a minute. So were you mostly at a desk or a computer doing stuff like this? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I was, I was at... My, my desk was right here and my computer was right there. I actually had two computers. Uh, one to do all the Lockheed Martin time card stuff and things, which I hardly ever got on. And my other computer that linked my uh, computer class that I did all my CFD on. And then I had my window right there. And anytime they start, they, they tested uh, an engine, uh, my, my window would start vibrating. And I'd get up and I'd look out my window and I'd say, oh, they're testing an A2 right now. And I'd sit down and keep working at my, uh, at my engine, or my computer, and then about five minutes later, it stopped, and I said, oh, I guess the test stopped. And the exciting times were when you were sitting working on <coughs> your computer, and you heard something starting, and then all of a sudden you heard a pop or a bang. And you said, oh, something really exciting just happened. And then we'd all wander out and go talk to, to Lester and say, Lester, what just happened? Well, I think they were running the, the hydrogen peroxide pump right then. I think it probably blew up. And we found out, like, sure enough, the hydrogen peroxide pump blew up. So it was, but, so yeah, I, I got to wander around those things when I wanted to, but most of my time was spent. At, at a computer. And were you developing the codes? Like when, when you mentioned codes, uh, mostly not. Uh, you, so you'd have someone else do that and then bring it back. Yeah, yeah. We we worked with a company called, well, Marshall had their code. NASA Marshall had their code, and we worked with them. Um, we worked with Mississippi State, who was developing a code, and uh, Marshall was adopting that. It never got to the state where it was very useful for us. And then Craft Tech was the company that we worked with, and they developed the code. So. So we, we, we weren't good code developers, so we let people who were better than us do that job. Mm -hmm. Let's see, was there another question back there? Um, how did you get it, or, uh, how were eight ways you were able to expand on your skill sets? Or like, were there programs the company put out or you had to look out for, for certain ways? I, I had, I, everything, it was, it was all self-motivated. I could have sat there and just done what they told me to do. And, uh, and when things came along, I could have said, oh, we don't have the tools to do that. Uh, and so it was mostly looking at what, in fact, test technology, the, the whole point of the test technology group was, you go look at what Stennis is doing and try to kind of figure out ways that we can do them better. And then propose them, and we'll get money to do that, and we'll, we'll, we'll do things. So that was kind of my job, was to, to look for ways to improve. Uh, Validation verification was one of those. Uh, that, that was one where I said, they, they didn't say anything about that, but I said, you know, I, we can make this better, this process better. And, and, uh, and uh, the new tools, uh, developing new tools was, was another thing. Other, other people in test technology were developing new sensors, things like that. Um. When you were at school, when you were going through your graduate and your math, or your graduate and your doctorate, were you, um, was there any specific type of work you were looking at going for, or were you just studying to study? Uh, I'm not sure. My my uh, my master's advisor wrote a a, a letter to my PhD advisor. Uh, uh, when I was getting close to, to finishing up, saying, oh yeah, Russell was, has always been interested in going into teaching, and I didn't know that. But uh, I must have said that sometime to, to somebody. Um, uh, I don't know, I kind of, I, I, I stayed in school because I didn't know I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> so I got done with my bachelor's and thought, oh, I don't know what I want to do yet, so I got a master's, and got done with my bachelor's and thought, I don't know what I want to do yet, so I got a PhD, and Fortunately, I'm not. Well, no, I am still in school. Never mind. <laughs> anyway, so here I am still. Um, but, but no, I. It wasn't. Some people have this drive and this passion. I really want to build jet engines for GE, and I never had anything like that. Okay. Any other questions? Um, what's the level of difficulty like a graduate school? Is it a 
The classes are harder. Uh, it's more demanding. Um, a typical graduate school load is you take two or three classes a semester. Uh, three classes is a really heavy load. Two classes is a, is a more reasonable load. Um, what, but while you're getting your master's, you typically do take three classes. When, you, when you're moving on to a PhD, it'll typically be one or two classes and you're working on your, your, uh, your research work. However, people also ask, well, I've heard statics, 201, is, a really, is, is kind of a, a challenging class. Any of you heard that? Okay. If you haven't heard it, 201 can be kind of a challenging class. And people say, well, does that mean that, that uh, when we get to the, the high-level classes, like, like the 300 and 400 level classes, they aren't quite as challenging as 201? And the answer is, well, no. They're actually more challenging than that, but you get used to it. And graduate school is the same way. So after you've been through your, your senior level uh, undergraduate classes, you move on to your, uh, your, your uh, graduate level classes and it's, it's kind of a, a step up, but it's not too big of a step because you're kind of used to it. So it's more challenging, but you're, because of the previous classes and experiences, you're able to take it? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So when you say that more prestigious universities give out more grant money, how do you get that? I mean, oh, as a student, that's the easy part. Uh, I, I had I had a uh, one of my friends in graduate school. His he uh, he he had hit a, a sticky part in his research, and he was having a hard time getting past it. And my advisor was getting really frustrated with him. And one time, my advisor at the end of their meeting, he said, "Look, I've done the hard part. I got you the money. You've got the easy part. Go get it done." <laughs> so getting the money is kind of the hard part, and and you'll you'll hook up with a professor who's already got the money, and you'll just, just say, you know, I've looked at your research work. I'm really interested in uh, heat transfer and liquid jets, and and I know that you're one of the leading researchers in the nation doing that kind of stuff. Do you have any positions open for me? And he'll say, Well, I've got two grants coming up right now, and uh, yeah, I'm looking for a couple of masters and a couple of PhD students on both of those. And you'll say, Well, would you, if you, if you'd consider me, I'd I'd greatly appreciate it. And they'd say, You're hired. And then you go and do the work. <laughs> the last 10% of the work. He's already done 90% of it. So yeah, uh, you, you just you, you find a professor who has uh, who has money and who's hiring a student, and then you're in. Okay. I mean, you can get. There are some uh, fellowships out there. Some Department of Energy, Department of Defense fellowships, National Science Foundation fellowships that are out there, and you can go for those. And if you get one of those, then you can go anywhere you want to because anyone will take you because you, you're bringing your own funding with you. But, uh, but that's not how most people get their funding. Okay. Well, I think that probably wraps up our time. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks, Russell. Thank you. Okay, remember what we're doing next, next week? Just your bridge. Yep. Get our bridges.